This week on The Gadget Show, I put flat screen tellies to the test. Should you go for plasma or LCD? Or should you actually plump for a projector? Can you really get a good digital camera for under 150 quid? I test the best with a spot of wildlife photography. And are Macs still the sexiest computers in the world? One gadget I can guarantee you're using right now is your telly. It's the gadget we spend more time using than any other. On average, you'll spend 10 years of your life just sitting and watching this thing. So, of all the gadgets you ever buy, getting this one right is pretty important. Here on The Gadget Show, every time we review televisions to try and work out which one you should buy, we draw the same conclusion. For pure picture quality, you just can't beat the good old cathode ray tube. It may be a bit bulky and unfashionable, but the oldest and cheapest technology available really does offer the clearest, sharpest and truest image. So there you have it. If you need a new telly, you should go out and buy a CRT. It's obviously the rational choice. But since when was buying gadgets rational? Our gadgets are a whole lot more than functional electronic devices. They're things of beauty possessions to covet and show off. Buying gadgets is all about desirability, getting the latest technology wrapped up in the most mouth-wateringly stunning design. And that desire for new stylish technology is precisely why the cathode ray tube is disappearing from our homes. Sales are dropping and factories are closing all over the world. Because what we really want are these blooming great big flat screen tellies, LCDs and plasmas. Come on, you know you want one. I mean, how cool is your house going to look with one of these hanging on the wall? Sony, who once dominated all things electronic, have been hit hardest by the drop in CRT sales. Their TV division, which put off the change to LCD and plasma much longer than rivals, announced a loss in the first quarter of this year of £200 million. By contrast, Sharp and Panasonic, who have been at the forefront of developing LCD and plasma technology respectively, are reporting ever healthier profits, and it's predicted by some that demand for big flat screens will outstrip supply as early as next summer. Now, I know that the picture quality on plasmas and LCDs has been a bit ropey for quite a long time, but the good news is it's getting better and better. Although, if you're looking at a big screen, say 42 inches, you won't get much change from three grand for a good plasma, or five grand for a good LCD. Happily though, when it comes to coming up with a convincing argument for spending the price of a small car on a huge telly, there's a very practical argument for buying one. Next year, Sky will start high-definition broadcasting. That'll mean picture quality at least four times better than we have at present. CRT tellies can't cope with high-definition pictures. To enjoy them, you'll have to have a plasma or an LCD. But a word of warning, before you rush out and buy the first great big telly that you set your eyes on, make sure that it's got a sticker on it saying that it's high-definition TV or HD ready. Failing that, look for one of these, an HDMI interface or at least some form of digital input. And be careful, there are still thousands of brand new plasmas and LCDs on the market which aren't HD ready, and unsurprisingly, they're being sold off now very cheaply. Those things are fine though, if all you want to do is have a set to watch the news on for the next 12 months. But if, like me, you're buying a TV that should last you three or four years, then surely you want it to be capable of showing high definition broadcasts in all their glory when they finally arrive. And even before the advent of HD, there's nothing better than watching a DVD on one of these big screen tellies, plugged up to a good surround sound system. But which format should you choose? LCD or plasma? Well, stick around for our grand flat screen challenge, when we try to find out once and for all which of the big boys has the best picture. <laughs> There's no better test of a compact digital camera than a family day out. And here at the West Midlands Safari Park, me and my girls are testing 10 of them, which with a keen bit of internet price searching, you can get for between 100 and 150 pounds. What do you think of the rhinos, girls? 
Never been so close to one. You get a lot more for your cash now than you did just a few months ago. But can you really get decent pictures at this price? Well, every one of these cameras has four or five megapixels. All but one has a proper optical zoom and they can all record movie clips. But there are some things you don't get for this kind of money. You're unlikely to get a set of rechargeable batteries thrown in, for example. So you'll probably need to invest in some if you use your camera a lot. And you're unlikely to get any manual control of shutter speeds or apertures. This is mainly strict point-and-shoot territory. You're also unlikely to find a decent wide angle or a long telephoto lens, or the latest features like image stabilization. But looking at my initial results, they're all capable of turning out sharp enough pictures that would make a good A4 print. Though there are three cameras in particular that I'm starting to like. Kodak's EasyShare Z700, Olympus's Camedia C480, and Nikon's Coolpix 5600. Let's test them a bit more thoroughly. I've chosen it because it's very compact, it feels very well made, and so far it's delivering some of the best images. Now, it may not have manual control of shutter speed or aperture, but like many of these cameras, it tries to make up for it with a bewildering variety of modes. Some you select with this dial here. The sports mode, portrait mode, which helps throw the background out of focus, and other modes you select from this screen. There's fireworks mode, museum mode, beach mode, even a party mode. Not sure any of them are appropriate for giraffes, so I think I'll switch it to automatic. One disappointment was the camera's tendency to choose slow shutter speeds on telephoto settings, so many of the shots were blurred. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the Olympus has even more modes than the Nikon. 19 of them, in fact. But that's not why I'm here with the spiders. It's because of the amazing super close focus facility, which allows you to get closer than any of the other cameras. In fact, you can get closer than with some of the expensive macro lenses available for SLRs. It's also one of the cheapest cameras we're testing, but one way they've cut costs became obvious when we visited the seals. There's no viewfinder, just a display, which is fine for indoors. Out here in broad daylight, though, even with this relatively bright screen, it's still quite hard to see what you're shooting. So sometimes you do need a viewfinder after all. One other economy they've made annoys me even more, though. The movie mode doesn't include sound. How irritating! I was tempted to test this one with the camels. It looks so gawky, but we're going to use it to track down the white lions and white tigers instead. That's because alone amongst these cameras, it's got a long telephoto lens, a five times optical zoom, which means it's equivalent to 175 millimeters on a 35 millimeter camera, which could come in handy. And zoom in now. Obviously, with the long lens setting, you're more likely to get camera shake. But unlike the Nikon, you can go into the menu, select manual mode, and increase the sensitivity. There, 400 ASA. The shutter speed goes up, and I should get a steady shot. Also, it's the only camera here to give me complete control of aperture and shutter speed if I want it. The EasyShare did have a relatively large appetite for batteries, and it was one of the bulkiest of the cameras I tried. But I found it on the internet for under £130. It produced really lifelike colour, and it had one of the best movie modes. Taking all things into consideration, this Kodak was definitely my choice. Providing you can live with its looks and you invest in a good set of rechargeable batteries, I think it's a bargain. Right, girls, one last shot. Now it's time for another in our regular series of guides that show you how to get the most out of your gadgets. This week, how to get pictures off your mobile phone. These days, most mobile phones come with cameras, and it's great to have your photos just a button push away. But what if you want to keep them forever? 
how do you get your pictures off your mobile phone? First, don't overlook the obvious. If your phone has a memory card, simply take it out of the phone and transfer the files using your computer's card slot or USB card reader. They're picture files like any other. Many mobiles come with their own software packages and connector cables. Install the software onto your PC, use the cable to attach your phone and you can manage your media easily, downloading pickies from your phone onto your computer. And if you've got photos on your computer that you'd like to keep on your phone, you can transfer the other way too. If your phone has Bluetooth capability, then you can transmit the pictures wirelessly onto your PC. Install the Bluetooth software onto your computer and plug in the USB dongle. When the Bluetooth is enabled on both devices, your phone and computer can talk to each other, allowing you to magically send your pics. Don't forget that you can email the pictures from your phone to an email account, and it's cheaper and better quality than sending pictures via text message. If you simply can't wait to share your celebrity stalking moments, then this is an excellent way to impress your mates. Look, it's our Karen and television personality Steve Coogan. You could use an online service for storing your mobile photos. Just set up an account and you can email or text your photos onto your own online photo album. They get automatically saved in a folder that can be accessed by your chums. You can also get them printed out. These arrived a couple of days after ordering them, cost 19p each, and we were thrilled with the quality. Back to TVs now, and our search for the best big picture you can get. Interestingly, there seems to be something of a split between those of us who love a dirty, great big 60-inch flat screen and those who think they're a bit ugly and rather too expensive. Not surprisingly, I'm in the I love big tellies category. And so is my director, Dave, uh, the sound man, Ben, and Mike on camera. However, my girlfriend can't see the point of them. And interestingly, nor can David's wife, Ben's girlfriend, or Mike's missus. The fact is, unless you live alone, you first have to convince your other half. Not always an easy task. However, there is a way which doesn't involve having a huge glass screen plonked permanently in your lounge. You could have a digital projector, but are they suitable for using every day? We decided to find out with a real-world test. This semi-detached house in North London is the home of David and Jane. They live here with 10-year-old Louis and 18-month-old Ella, and they've got a nice big colour telly sitting in the corner of their living room which is great for watching movies, children's programmes and, of course, the gadget show. Until today, that is. You see, they're putting their old telly away and trying out a brand new DLP projector complete with stand-up screen. So, how will they cope with the practicality of having a movie screen in their living room? It'll definitely give them a bigger picture and is much more state-of-the-art than their old cathode ray tube box. But can they actually live with a projector day to day. I thought it was going to be a lot of setting up, it was going to take a long while. Ella's patience is minimal, as you can see, so I was thinking this is going to be a long afternoon. It was a long afternoon. Yes. Uh-oh, it's on Elvis. That's not good, is it? But the boys saw things differently. It took us about 15 minutes to get a decent picture on the screen. Uh, we didn't actually refer to the instructions and managed to do it pretty easily. I thought it, it was going to be really hard to put up and everything, but it was actually very easy. We just got it together very quickly. You're going Louis bird. The picture angle took us a little bit longer. Obviously, without using the instructions, uh, we had to sort of trial and error a bit. It was a lot of faff. And once we got that set up, that was much better. When we finally got to grips with the equipment, I'd kind of lost interest. I can see the potential, but it just took too long to get there. It would be great to set up and do a big movie evening, but otherwise... The picture was really good. Um, obviously, with a darker room, it would be slightly better. Uh, we were watching it mid-afternoon, and even then, it was quite a good picture. The colours were bright, um, the contrast was pretty good. It is not an everyday item. Or you'd have to redesign the whole room to make it 
easily an everyday item and you just wouldn't want that hideous screen either. You can you know, move it around fairly easily, whereas a 42-inch plasma isn't that straightforward to move about. Um, and I think you get a better big screen picture experience. A cinema experience is not top of my agenda. I think ease and accessibility, non-faff entertainment is, is what I need. I thought I would really like to have one. I would have one tomorrow. It seems that the sexual divide is as strong with projectors as it is with other big screen tellies. But if you're still itching for a more conventional LCD or plasma screen, then join us later when we'll be giving you the definitive guide on which gives you the best picture on the market today. Last year on The Gadget Show, we decided to try and find out which was better, a Mac or a PC. First, we checked out prices and compared what you got for your money, and decided that PCs always offered you more. Then we ran a time trial to see which was quickest to set up straight out of the box and get you connected to the internet. And this time, the Mac was the clear winner. Next, using identically priced high-end models, Jason tested how quick they were on a variety of functions like game playing and rendering graphics. Surprisingly, the PC was much faster. Whoops. And finally, we performed the first ever physical crash test of computers. A little extreme, maybe, but we did it for a very sensible reason, to see which was easiest and cheapest to repair. In this test, the PC won hands down. Even after such a catastrophic impact, we had it working after just two hours at a cost of £65. The Mac would have gone away to a specialist for three days and cost at least £500. In the light of these tests, we decided that PCs had the edge. But within days of broadcasting our findings, the Gadget Show office was snowed under with irate mail from Mac lovers. They thought we'd got it wrong and wanted us to give them the right of reply. So we have, in the shape of the Gadget Show's friendly technology guru, Tom Dunmore. He's a fully-fledged, flag-waving Mac fan, and he's here to put the case for the defence. Now, Tom, I've just bought this uh, Sony Veo PC, obviously, laptop. Um, do you think I made the wrong decision? Uh, not necessarily made the wrong decision. I must say, if I was in your shoes, um, I would have probably gone for a, an Apple PowerBook. Um, I've been using Apples for, I don't know, the past eight or nine years of my life, and um, I would find it very hard to go back to Windows. I just love Macs. They, they are just much more fun to use. and. Crucially, they, they look so much better. Do you think that makes it a much more satisfying experience if you're using a better designed object? Absolutely. Now, I spend probably 12 hours a day in front of a computer of one sort of, or another, and I'd much rather it was a, a great-looking machine with fantastic-looking software. The latest version of, of uh, the Mac operating system, Tiger, has got some amazing features that you just won't find on, on Windows. Ooh, yes, um, it's got for example, the dock, which is really simple, just a, a way of switching between applications. They just oh, get a I lovely like animated like effect. And then on top of that, all Apple computers come with a selection of software called iLife, which is a, this creative software. It's all you know, relatively basic, but it's so easy to use. It's things like iMovie, iTunes, iDVD, these, these applications that make it very easy to make your movies, to store your photos, to, to listen to your music. All those things that people want to do with their computers, but don't want to have to invest hours and hours reading through manuals. It comes all together, it's integrated, yeah. it works together. You can switch between iMovie and iDVD and it, it all kind of works together mm. and it's so simple that's the mm. thing there's no barrier in between and, you yeah. being creative you know and it looks good while you and it, it looks fantastic it does, while, it while you're using it but what would still put me off getting one I think is the software issue which is that there are still some bits of software that won't run on that 
There are, if I played games, for example, I couldn't play them on that. Yeah. If you want to play games, buy yourself an Xbox or a PS2 because, you know, these things cost £100 and they are designed for gaming. There's nowhere near as much um, viruses or nasty software that will infect your computer uh, as compared to uh, Windows. Macs are a lot more secure. There's I mean, is that just because there are so few Macs around that nobody bothers to write it for Macs? It is to do with, with the lack of numbers of Macs, but it's also because the operating system is more secure. It's much easier. To, to hack into the, the Windows system. So, you know, it, it, it is an important issue. If you're really worried about the security of your computer, I think a, a Mac is a better system to go for. But I'm worried about it, but I, but I mean, I've always found that just putting a few basic sort of antivirus, usually free and... If I buy more. a television, I don't expect to have to go and download software so that people won't hack into it, you know. That's, it, That's it, it should, it should run somewhere. like that when you... <laughs> <laughs> it should run like that when you buy it, when you take it out of the box. You shouldn't need to go and find these things. You know, what about if no, you didn't know that you needed to go and no, find virus software? So, do you think I've still bought the wrong thing, or not necessarily? Because uh, you know, if you're happy using that and you like what it does, that's fine. But I think that. You know, if you were new to computers, certainly I'd say a Mac is what you want. If you're worried about viruses, I'd go for a Mac. If you want something that's really high design, both outside and in, I'd go for a Mac. But I mean, if you're more concerned about software compatibility or, or paying less bucks, then yeah, fine, you stick with your Windows. I'll take the Mac. <laughs> but but the, the fact remains, I picked up far more wireless networks with mine than you did with yours, and my batteries last longer. <laughs> That's so unfair. What, firstly, <laughs> Apple, Apple pretty much invented wireless Ooh. networks. They were doing it long before Windows were. And secondly, we've just had to cut because your battery went. After yours. <laughs> <laughs> Max may have a myriad of other pluses that I'm sure the boys will go on arguing about all day, but what makes them really stand out for most of us is their unique and sexy styling. Despite producing computers love for both their soft and hardware, for a long time Apple's computer range was famously dull and dreary to look at. Then, in the late 90s, Apple suddenly revolutionised their Mac range producing single-unit iMacs, available in a variety of eye-catching colours. The iMac's translucent one-piece case was a welcome departure from the legions of grey boxes being produced elsewhere. They turned computers into desirable objects, gadgets you'd want on show rather than tucked away under a desk. And with each new model, their desktop computers became more stylish and more beautiful. And this is the latest iMac with just a two-inch thick screen that contains everything. Hard drive, processor, graphics card, the lot. Even the mouse is an object of beauty. This really is a computer to covet. But we wanted a real expert's opinion. Lee Benson owns the renowned Number 9 The Gallery, which is full of pieces worth well into five figures. So is the Mac a worthy exhibit? This is pure art form. Not only is it sleek, its lines are absolutely pure, and that outer casing just solidifies the whole beauty of it. So simplicity is the key? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just not the front, but when you go around the back, again, just beautiful lines. Does white add to the simplicity? White is pure imperfection. A bit like that piece of work next to it, which was made in the 60s. Past, present, future, all in one piece of art. When it comes to sexy computers, Mac have had it their own way for a long time now, so we thought it was time to see whether PCs are starting to catch up. We've brought together a selection of some of the more stylish desktop PCs available. For once, we're not interested in how powerful they are or how big their memory is. Today, it's all about their looks. Sony have always been a style-conscious manufacturer with their VIO range of PCs, and this new £1,700 RA304 stays true to their Black is Beautiful philosophy. Just look at this. This could be a piece of sculpture, because you have these beautiful lines, and you can actually see through, so it's not just a lump. I like the fact that you don't have to see everything here as well, so when you're not using it, it could be a piece of art. How and do you feel about the black and chrome? Well, it works. Mm. I mean, that's... A bit like a bike, isn't it? Yeah. They've spent a lot of money trying to make this look right, not just from a keyboard and from a computer point of view, but to make it sit nice in the home as well. And I think they've done a good job. So a hit in your opinion? Oh yeah, I like that. Moving on. 
The Cubit 5 from Hoojim comes in a variety of bright colours, though this chrome finish is by far their most stylish. Despite its compact size, Hoojim say it has the functionality of the fastest tower PCs and sells for around £1,250. This is quite amazing because this is not trying to follow a computer-looking computer. It is. Well, it's not your regular processor, is it? You, it doesn't not. look like one. I think it's very clever. Well, I wouldn't have it like that, that way around. I'd have that as the front, so you've just got... Well, like that? A, yeah, a chrome box. I think that looks really nice. But then you're going to have all the wires coming out the back here. You've got all the stuff you've got to try and get here. I think... Mm. Now, look, here's a thought. Little mini stack. Hide the wires, and then you've got an interesting cube. Advent claim their new £1,000 Media Centre PC is a computer designed for the living room. But would it find a place in Lee's home? It is Betamax 19 God knows what. It is horrible. Chuck it. Out. That. Whatever it is inside mm -hmm. says nothing on the outside. It's big, bulky, boring, horrendous. It's just not of this era. The handcrafted Savro Diamond combines cutting edge technology with luxurious design. But it comes at a price. This top of the range model sells for 25 grand. Oh, this is this is class and quality and curves and Let's put two wheels on it and cycle down Highway 66. This is the Harley. This is really cool. Oh, it's top range Vespa, but it's sex on the box, isn't it? What you really need to do is have a look at here, all technologies inside. What well, do you that's think of that? cool. Well, it makes the insides of a computer look a bit more interesting. But what attracts me more is it's almost Art Deco. It is quite Art that Deco. That shape isn't is Art Deco. It? Look at the way they've cut out their name, look, diamonds all cut out there. I mean, that's beautiful. And then, here we have a 1930s building. Mm. Absolutely. So you but like then, that? Mmm, I don't think I'd have a problem placing that in my home. So, Lee, what do you think of what you've seen today? Well, honestly, I think computers have come a long way from the early days, and we've seen some good examples of that here. But from a purely design point of view, if you could take one of these away today, which one would it be? Oh, there's only one. Please. It's, it's the Mac. Just, just sheer perfection. Pure, simple, beautiful. Now on The Gadget Show, it's time for our grand big screen TV challenge. It's time to find out, once and for all, which of the big tellies, plasma or LCD, will give you the best picture quality. And just in case there's any cheating going on, Tanya is going to blindfold me and take me to the test room. Not strictly necessary, I'm just kinky like that. One second. I was about to test three TVs with screens each over 40 inches. Hi. How are you doing? Just married. <laughs> there was a top-notch plasma, a high-end LCD, and a budget plasma that you can buy for under a grand. All I needed to do was choose which I thought had the best picture and which had the worst. For the plan to work, I couldn't know which TV I was watching at any time throughout the test, and so I wouldn't be unduly influenced by the sound quality I was wearing headphones. First up was the expensive plasma, the Fujitsu P42. It costs £2,999, has a nice big 42-inch screen, is obviously HD-ready, and Fujitsu reckon their AVM2 technology, which is used in this telly, produces the best picture quality available on the plasma market. To test the TVs, I'll be watching Susie riding a rather clever little jet ski from the first series of The Gadget Show. We chose this footage because there's plenty of movement, loads of colours, and because it's always a pleasure to watch Susie in a wetsuit. Well, that was really, really interesting. Um, I mean, what was difficult about that image to discern was the fact that there weren't that many close-ups. And often on a close-up, that's when you see the structure of the pixels and any sort of uh, phasing in the colours, which is often found on cheap LCD and plasma screens. There was also uh, a very fluid motion on the screen, although I could see that uh, in the background, some of the foliage at the far edge of the lake, it wasn't that clear. 
Um, so it's a sort of mid-range screen, I would guess. I wouldn't get excited about that picture. It wouldn't warm me uh, to the core if I'd paid a couple of thousand pounds for it. Um, if I'd paid more than that, I certainly wouldn't be impressed. Next, I was shown the cheap plasma. It's sold by Goodman's for just £999. Again, it's got a 42-inch screen, but it isn't HD ready. Remember, I have no idea what telly I'm watching. Fascinating. I would have to say that I think uh, my initial gut response to that image is that it's the poorer of the two. Uh, it's not as clear as the first screen that I looked at. There seemed to be more digital breakup, uh, certainly in the background where the foliage across the lake uh, was situated. I mean, you, you couldn't see any detail at all. It was just a mass of different browns and greens. Also, at one point in Susie's face, I saw pixels that I hadn't seen on the, seen on the previous image. Um, I would also say that it was the, the brightness was a lot more evident. It was kind of washed out as an image. Um, the text, the subtitles that kind of punctuated the piece. On this set, um, I found that they were a little more degraded, pixelated, boxy, not particularly sharp. So almost like a mist, a kind of milky haze pervaded the experience, and it was definitely the lesser of the two. Finally, the LCD. This Sharp Aquas is the biggest and most expensive of the three. It's got a 45-inch screen and costs £4,500. We were unable to test a cheap LCD with a big screen because at the moment there really is no such thing. It's only very recently that LCD screens have grown over 40 inches, but with billions being invested in this technology every year, this may be the format that eventually comes out on top. Well, to my mind, there is no competition. That is definitely the best image of the three I've seen sat here. It still suffers from the, the telltale signs of an image on a flat screen system. Um, it's a bit pasty at times. There's, there's breakup in some of the, uh, the more action oriented scenes. But there was, just a, there was more of a landscape uh, to that image. It was a more grandiose experience watching it um, than on the other two. And again, the telltale foliage in the background, uh, there was just more clarity. It was almost like the leaves and the trees were in better focus on this set than they were in the others. Um, the subtitling on this was certainly as clear, if not clearer, than set number one, uh, but certainly, without a doubt, um, head and shoulders above set number two. So without any question, I would say that this was the better image, and I would imagine it would be the more expensive of the uh, three options. Fortunately for the manufacturers, my judgment accurately reflected their prices, with the £4,500 Sharp Aquas LCD coming out ahead of the £3,000 Fujitsu Plasma screen, which in turn outgunned the £1,000 Plasma from Goodman's. Watching all three sets simultaneously it becomes clear to me the difference in quality. Well, one thing I will say is I'm not going to go back on anything I said. It's obvious that set two is the worst one, set number one occupies our middle position, and the winner today is set number three. The only real question, I guess, is whether the hike in quality from set two to three is worth three and a half thousand pounds. I'm not sure it is. What you have to bear in mind is that if I'd bought set two, I wouldn't have had the advantage of a challenge like this. I'd have it up on my wall, having spent only a thousand pounds, and chances are, I'll be very happy with it. Mantis is the biggest all-terrain operational hexapod in the world, weighing in at two tons. You even have to put a finger to the keyboard. Video link has well and truly arrived. Here's how to get started.